one of the questions I get the most often uh, from candidates that I screen is what can I look forward to in terms of support mm -hmm. to my teaching in the classroom? I hired a great teacher out of California last year from Mount Jordan. Uh, she stayed in Canyons District teaching science at, an, at the high school now. She might stay, but I doubt it. Focus on the students. Focus on the kids. Make sure that you're having fun working with the kids every day. I want to make sure that you understand one thing, that your child is important to me. And I know that they're the most important thing to you. And so it's really important that we work together for them. Rarely, if, if ever, once I've kind of made that shift in how I handle discipline, have ever had a parent not thank me and say, wow, this is the first time my kid has gotten in trouble. And I've really walked away feeling good about it. Mm -hmm. Said, gosh, you know, I just want to be able to do my work in the back of a classroom. I would offer that advice to district office folks, mm -hmm. to people who are coaching teachers, to make sure that they're in the classroom seeing what's happening every day. I am Jethro Jones, your host, and welcome to The Transformative Principle. I'm excited to have you back for part two of my interview with Doug Hollenbeck at Union Middle School in Sandy, Utah. In this episode, we are going to hear about how to attract and retain great talent. And he's going to have a nice little side discussion about general trends in teaching and hiring and retirement and pretty fun little discussion. He's also going to talk about what is special in his office and his advice for how to be a transformative assistant principal. I hope you enjoy it. I'd like to welcome a new sponsor to the podcast this week. It is creativesforeducation.com. Have you ever noticed that teachers are really great at teaching our students, but don't have the time or the training to create beautiful things? Creativesforeducation.com does that for you. As an educator, you can sign up for a free account, request the designer create a project for you, give them some guidelines and tips, and then within about a week, they'll get something back to you that looks amazing. Go to creativesforeducation.com, click on the design requests, and you'll be able to look at some of the things that have already been done. Then sign up for a free account and start making beautiful things for your students. That's creativesforeducation.com or creatives, the number four, edu.com. I'll be honest with you, Jethro. I'm very worried about the state of, of teaching in Utah in terms of um, we're in a teacher shortage. We're going to be in a major teacher shortage here. Um, it's being masked by the economy mm -hmm. here. Uh, Utah's economy is better than other states, but we have been able to hire some incredible talent. I have Skyped on the phone with people all over the country looking to move here because there's jobs here. Right. Um, and I'm very fearful because I lived through times when I first started uh, as an assistant trying to hire people back in, in the mid-2000s when the market was, I mean, you could not find a teacher. And if you had a teacher on uh, that was on your list that you wanted to hire, they had three or four right. offers on the table. And so um, it is going to be a very precarious thing. Right. down the road. I had a conversation with one of our board members just a few weeks ago who's been attending some committee meetings through the state office of ed, and they're talking about how do we bolster retention programs? How do we support our teachers to be in the classroom? When, and, you know, we, we are headed for a shortage. So it's it's not going on, falling on deaf ears, but right. um, quite honestly, I've said this before, we've got the best teacher prep programs that Wyoming and Nevada can buy right. because unfortunately we keep losing some great talent to mm -hmm. neighboring states and it's just a dollars and cents. It comes down to, Hey, how am I going to feed my family? Right. And, um, it's an unfortunate thing, but it is something that we face in Utah. Yeah. So, so. what we're going to have to start being much more cognizant of is how do we attract talent to our schools mm -hmm. when there's no financial differentiation? There's no, you know, reimbursing of um, student loans. I mean, there's for Title I, so we have that advantage. Um, but it's also a much harder school. 
how how do you think we should attract that talent to our school? What can we do as schools to to get people to want to be at our schools? That's a good question, uh, and I would answer it this way. Um, one of the most often, uh, one of the questions I get the most often uh, from candidates that I screen is, "What can I look forward to in terms of support mm-hmm. to my teaching in the classroom?" And that gives me the opportunity to talk about uh, the EPL coaches that we have, mm-hmm. um, which the excellent, which provide excellent professional development. It gives me the opportunity to talk about the summer professional development, the fact that they will have uh, mentor teachers in the classroom, or you know, available to them. Uh, the administrative staff would be available. Um, you know, we talk about those resources. And you can see candidates get very excited about, about what we have here in canyons because of those kinds of things. Um, they want to make sure that they have that support. And I think that's probably the number one thing that we can do to retain those, those new teachers mm-hmm. is make sure that they have that support in the classroom. I mean, statistically, 50% of teacher graduates never go into the profession. Of the 50% that do, 50% of those are gone within the first five years. So if you're only putting one out of four teachers out of prep programs into classrooms Mm -hmm. for a career, you're going to end up with ultimately a a problem, a staffing problem, a human resource problem in the end. It's just, um, I was very disappointed in 2011 when they created tier two retirement Mm -hmm. in the state of Utah. I don't think that that's going to help with retention and longevity. Um, as disappointed that that's just not the move you want to do. And I understand it's an economic, right. we want to keep that funded. We want to make sure that it's there and those kinds of things. But I think that that was a move that hopefully they'll, they'll legislate back out of it because I think uh, that's going to hurt Utah in the mm-hmm. long run. Other States have moved to it and I get that. But uh, when we look at what we're asking teachers to do in Utah um, at a tier two, 35 years for retirement, um, with a number of class, you know, the class sizes that we're asking them to work with, um, we are going to burn teachers out left and right. We're not yeah. going to get any of them to, to that point, and they're just going to leave. Yeah. And that's not solving our problems. At yeah. All. At a certain point, it becomes you might as well stay in a district or in a state because you put in so many years. Mm-hmm. And with 35 years, then that makes it... All bets are off. Right. You know, I can go have another full career in another state mm-hmm. instead of sticking around here to try to meet that that end goal that to a brand new teacher, 35 years is a long time away. Yeah. And most of them are not thinking about that. Nope. And and so nope. they may they may take a job to have one, but when they're in it five years and start looking at that, they're going to say, yeah. maybe this isn't the right place for me. Yeah. And that... It, and do you blame them? Yeah. I don't blame them at all. I mean, and of course that's comes back to commitment. Are they committed? And, and if they're not, I mean, we've got some great teachers uh, right here at union from around the country and um, a couple of ladies from Michigan, fantastic teachers. Mm-hmm. Why are they here? They're here because there's jobs here, you know, the Midwest right. and East coast, there's just, they, there's no jobs. Right. And um, I would hate to lose them, but I also, again, getting to know your teachers, I know that their families are back there. They're missing their families. Uh, and probably if given the right opportunity, they're going to bail mm-hmm. and they're going to go back. Um, I hired a great teacher out of California last year from Mount Jordan. Uh, she stayed in Canyons District teaching science at, an, at the high school now. She might stay, but I doubt it. Mm-hmm. I would doubt it. I would think she probably would go back to California. And, you know, so there's just three instances that I've come across in the last two years of teachers that would, you know, are here for, for the job. They're not mm-hmm. here for the retirement yep. and they all, they'll bail. Mm-hmm. And so how do we attract that? How do we keep them here? How do we right. make it? So, I mean, it's, it's a great place to live. It's why I moved here, but ultimately you've got to be able to provide for your family and, right. and, uh, and be real, be realistic. Yeah. Um, that was a great side discussion, by the way. Thanks for sharing your thoughts on that. <laughs> I'm sure that's not what you want to put in this blog, but no, that's fine. That's great. I think that's going to spark some good discussion. It's it's a very real issue that we got to be aware of. So, yeah. Um, so another question is what is uh what is advice you would give to an assistant principal today to that they can start doing today to help them become a transformative assistant principal? Um. 
Do you know, it's been said that if you, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. Uh, I would say to any assistant principal, if, if they're recently out of the classroom and they're, they're in this job and they're, um, trying to figure out what, what should I focus on? Focus on the students, focus mm -hmm. on the kids, make sure that you're having fun working with the kids every day, because it's, it's very easy. The assistant principal, of course, we deal with a lot of discipline. We deal right. with those kinds of things, part of the job. And, and, and I'm happy to do that job. Um, but we also can get mired down when we only see the students that are struggling uh, behaviorally uh, in classes. And so I would say to them, make sure that they get out and be in the classrooms, be with student body officers or student councils, or uh, make yourself part of awards uh, and positive recognition. Um, and make sure that your your behavior approach is one that is always going to be positive mm -hmm. uh, with students. And making sure that um, parents know that your approach is always going to be positive with their child. Um, I think that, and this has happened to me over the years, where parents, they're different today uh, than when I started teaching. Um, there's, unfortunately, Jethro, there's some uh, animosity or... Um, I don't know the right word, but there's a feeling from parents sometimes, not all parents, that it's an us and them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've faced this in, in conversations, and I've had to stop uh, conversations and say, wait a minute, I want to make sure that you understand one thing, that your child is important to me. And I know that they're the most important thing to you. And so it's really important that we work together for them. And so I just got some goosebumps. Oh. <laughs> I'm not even a parent of one of your students at your school, but I I can feel that you've said that many times before yeah. and that you that's really what you believe. And that's really um, how you feel. And I wish that everybody could be looking into your eyes when you said that, because <laughs> you definitely were emanating a care and concern and love for the student. And a is, this is crazy that we are fighting mm -hmm. when we really both want what's best. And right. that was, that's awesome. Yeah. And, and it took me a little bit to get to that point uh, and to realize that that is the approach that I have to take mm -hmm. uh, when I get some adversarial parents. And, um, and once you've reached that, once, once you've established that common ground, um, the conversation goes very differently. Yeah. Um, I had an opportunity to go to China a couple of years ago. And we got to meet with some principals while we were there. And one of the principals asked the group that we were with, um, you know, how, how do you help students that, that aren't engaged? Well, we face that problem here. <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> it's universal. And so I, I started talking about, you know, talk to me about how involved uh, your parents are and, and how connected this, the parents are with the school. And for them, that was kind of an unheard of, you know, they, parents, in, in my opinion, from what he was saying, again, I was going through a translator, so some things get messed up, um, was that when a parent sent their child to the school, it was the school's responsibility. They took over and the parent really had nothing to say, nothing, no input, no opinion, mm -hmm. nothing. And, and I told him, I said, uh, the, the triangle is the strongest geometric shape. Right. And so in my triangle, I have teachers, students, and parents. And when you've got these groups at the points of your triangle, you've got a connection. You've got a strong bond that are working for that child. And no matter where the pressure comes from at any point, you're going to be stronger by working together. Mm -hmm. And for him, it was like, wow, I never even thought about getting parents involved. Wow. And I don't know if there's a cultural connection that would prevent that from happening. But he was kind of amazed that we got our parents so involved. And so I think that um, for, for a young administrator uh, just starting out, making sure that you're communicating with those parents and making sure that they know that you care about their child and trying your hardest to create that triangle um, with your teachers, your parents, and your students. And being, sometimes you're the, you're the glue, you're the one in the middle that pulls it all together and makes sure that those joints stay connected. Right. Um, 
I, I use those terms because I'm an old shop teacher. So <laughs> I've taught about engineering. I've taught about, you know, those stressors and things like that. And, um, I think if we can establish that triangle that, um, the children are going to succeed, they're going to be able to have that support system and scaffold them to very high levels of achievement. Um, as long as we can, can help and make sure that that happens. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. It, it's definitely a hard thing to do. Um, going back to your idea of communicating with parents, making sure they know your approach is positive. It's really hard when you're the assistant principal and you're dealing with discipline yep. all day, every day, um, to establish that. How do you, how do you establish that communication and that awareness mm -hmm. with the parents? You know, when I first started, um, back at Elkridge, um, you know, the other system principal said, well, this is how we handle suspensions is, you know, and of course, uh, back then it was always exclusionary, you know, that was pretty much the whole discipline mm -hmm. system. Um, I've learned a lot over the years. Um, but one of the things that I would always do, cause we, unfortunately we still have to suspend kids and, and those kinds of things. Um, we still have to have some, some of that. I use a lot less of it today than I, than I certainly did back then. Um, but when I, when I bring a student back from a discipline issue like that, and I bring their parents and we reinstate them to school, I always use a statement similar to this. And that is, I just want you to know that we are a school. We are about teaching and learning. And I want us to walk away from this meeting with learning happening and that your child learns from this experience and learns how to conduct themselves or behave appropriately. Mm -hmm. um, and it just gives a great opportunity to put together an improvement plan and talk about um, how this affects their life, uh, whatever it is, if it's a fight or it's bringing something to school or uh, weapons or those kinds of things, um, making sure that the student walks out and your parents walk out feeling like they're supported in this child's learning that this experience, mm -hmm. although it's not a pleasant one, um, that they walk away feeling good about what I've taught them, what they have learned and, and verbalizing that in front of me, in front right. of their parents. Um, that's always been an important thing, uh, to me to make sure that again, it comes back to being student centered. Um, it's, it is a hard job. I mean, you're, you're judge, jury, and an right. executioner all at once. <laughs> and, uh, it's a tough position, but I, and, and I always make sure that I tell students, you know what, um, you made a bad choice, but that does not make you a bad kid ever. I don't want you to think that. And I don't want anybody to tell you that I'm going to be the first one to tell you that, yeah, you made a bad choice here, but that's why we're here. We're here to talk about it with you and your parents and myself. And what can you do better in the future? What can you do to change that? Mm -hmm. uh, I talk a lot about careers with kids and what they want to do and how they want to attain that. Uh, what is, what are the steps going to be? We're right in the cusp of high school here. So what is that going to look like for you? What, um, how can you better position yourself? Uh, to be successful in high school, you know, don't be scared of it. Be excited about it. Be ready for it. Right. That's the gateway to your, to your career in college. And, and, um, how are we going to do that? Behaving like this probably isn't going to get you there. <laughs> right. And so, um, you know, I rarely, if, if ever, once I've kind of made that shift in how I handle discipline, have ever had a parent not thank me and say, wow, this is the first time my kid has gotten in trouble. And I've really walked away feeling good about it, mm -hmm. that what you did here was really important and impactful. Mm -hmm. And I found that instances of recidivism have gone way down for kids that I've worked with through this process. Um, and I've, you know, the other assistant principals that I've worked with have kind of adopted what I've done. Mm -hmm. I'm teaching my intern right now how to do that and to make sure that we have those connections because it's a great opportunity right there to connect with, with those parents and make sure that again, we're a school we're about teaching and learning. That's what I want you to walk away with, with a learning experience from this. Mm -hmm. That's really amazing. Um, the idea that parents would walk away saying my kid messed up, but I feel good about it is, is pretty powerful. Yeah. And, and that's awesome. Um, so the last question I always ask people is what's something in your office, you're sparsely decorated, but <laughs> <laughs> what's something that you have in here that um, is meaningful to you or that is an anchor to you or that is something that reminds you of what you're doing? Um, is there something in here that, that, you, oh, wow. that has a special um, connection? 
They're, they're, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to unpack, to be honest with you. I, I moved mid year and, and have been running ever since. So, uh, it is pathetically. Um, one of the things I think that I covet the most, and they're not out, but, uh, are thank you notes that I get from parents and students and mm-hmm. teachers. Um, I collect those. I, I cherish those because, that makes me feel like I have really touched someone uh, at the school in a, in a positive way, that they would take the time to write me a thank you note. You know, emails are, are great, and we and we pass them around like it's you know, because it's so simple and easy. Right. But for someone to hand write a thank you note, uh, those are precious to me. Those are really important, and I try to write them as well. Mm-hmm. Um, to teachers to make that connection, to, to give them that little at a boy, at a girl for things that happen. Because I think that those are just those mementos that it's tangible. It's something you can hold on to. It's something you can look back to, yeah. um, and, and say, yeah, that makes me, that makes me feel good that, that I reached out and I, and I, and I worked with them and, and they recognize that. Yeah, so. that's really great. I've I've tried to do a better job writing thank you notes as well. And Sandra Dalhulahan, who's the principal of Sandy, mm-hmm. I interviewed her, her a couple of weeks ago, and she said that um, she had a teacher or a support staff come up to her and say that she had kept every single note that Sandra had written to her. And, you know, those simple things really do mean a lot. So what I tried to do this year is I tried, and I did it, when I did evaluations for teachers, mm-hmm. after I finished the observation part of the evaluation, before we had the um, professional development meeting, when we got their scores back, I wrote them a thank you note, thank mm-hmm. them for the opportunity to, to visit with them, mm-hmm. to learn how they were doing things in their classroom and to observe them. Mm-hmm. And um, I felt really good giving those. And I had a couple of teachers thank me and, and really mean it. Um, but I, I'm sure that that meant more than, than people gave me feedback about. And I, I, I know for me, sharing that information with them made me feel better and made me more excited to be working with them. And so it go, it helps both ends of that when you, when you do that. Mm-hmm. So that's neat that you keep those and, and treasure them. Yeah. Yeah. And I've carried them from job to job and I still mm-hmm. have a stack and, uh, and, and, you know, it, you, some days you get down and, and you, uh, you I, there's a couple things that I do. And that's one of the things I look at those, uh, mm-hmm. great things that people have given to me and I, and I get out into classrooms, Yeah, you know, I, I don't think we can do that enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, I worked with, uh, Molly Hart for a short bit. She's the one who actually took over Mount Jordan when I, I didn't take the position and she said, gosh, you know, I just want to be able to do my work in the back of a classroom. Right. And she's so funny because she's looking all the time for a stand-up desk that she could uh-huh. take her laptop and wheel it around. And, um, you know, it was a two-story building. And who knows, maybe the new building, she'll be able to do that. Right. But uh, <laughs> that, that kind of inspired me to, to try to get out there more. I mean, it's, it's so hard. You know, we want to get out there. We want to do those walkthroughs. We want to give that feedback. We want to... We want to be uh, communicating with those teachers about the good things that they do. And yeah. it's probably one of the hardest things to do is to get out there and, and to be able to do that. Um, we've got a lot of young teachers this year. So, you know, doing J passes or official evaluations are, 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 are one way, but it's really, yeah, the, yeah. But to get out there. And I think I mean, it's not easy to do, but, you, but make those connections with the teachers mm-hmm. and make sure that they know. And giving those thank you notes to them uh, will make it very, very precious. So yeah, that's uh, interesting. Well, I think our uh, time is up because you got your meeting to go to. But yeah, I sure that's appreciate good. your time. And is there anything you want to say as a sign off? Or <sighs> enjoy what you do and and love the kids. Laugh yeah. every day. Yeah. And um, if if you're not if you're not out there with the kids every single day you're going to miss the boat. Um, I, I worry for principals that don't get out there um, because for one reason or another, and I haven't worked with any. Mm-hmm. I've worked with some pretty amazing people, but I can see how that uh, is when you get to the principal level can remove you from, from students. I would offer that advice to district office folks, mm-hmm. to people who are coaching teachers to make sure that they're in the classroom 
seeing what's happening every day because it's yeah. change. It changes. The technology changes. The methods change. The engagement strategies. Are, you do need to stay up on the latest and the greatest. And so I would encourage any administrator, from the vice principal all the way up to the superintendent, to be in the classrooms because again, it's back to the students. Right. And keeping perspective of why we're all here. Yeah. Is is to stay focused on the students. Yeah. Absolutely. So, thanks so much, Doug. Oh, Appreciate you. it. Appreciate it, Jeff. Another great interview has concluded. Thank you so much for listening. I hope that you enjoyed it, and I hope you learned a lot from Doug. He is a great assistant principal, and if I ever have the opportunity to work under him as his assistant, I would be more than honored. If you would like to get in touch with me, you certainly can on Twitter. I am at Jethro Jones, or you can send me an email at jethrojones at gmail.com. Please be sure to share this with your friends, like us on Facebook, do all that social sharing stuff so that we can get the word out about how to be a transformative principal. And be sure to check out our sponsor, creatives4edu.com. We'll see you next week on The Transformative Principle.